E360 TV proudly presents messages of inspirational stories. Live streaming now to millions of devices, including Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire TV, Android TV, YouTube Live, Facebook Live, with your host, Donna Guinwa, producer and host, Jim Grant, producer and host, along with Michaela Vidal, administrator and host, and Gaia Guinwa Balconi Weda, editor in chief. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. How are you doing today? So good to be with you today. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about a subject that I've been putting off. <laughs> There's been several people, even here at the TV station, saying, Jim, you've got to get this information out. And I've been kind of reluctant. And it has to do with heart conditions because I had a heart attack last year. And the reason why I was um, thinking you know, kind of dreading doing it, to be honest with you, is because um, I did not want for it to appear like this is my story. You know, I had a heart attack. Well, whoop de do so do, so do hundreds of thousands of others. So I was a little bit, you know, uh, reluctant to even do it. And uh, I'm trying to do something here I forgot to do before I went live. So anyway, um, but they told me, says, Jim, some of the information that you learned in your pathway down through the, you know, your journey, um, you should get it out there to folks. Because just think about all the people who were just like you or who are just like I was, <laughs> wind up in the ER with a heart attack. And I thought, OK, I will. But before we do, I've got to give a shout out to a good friend of mine. Mr. Marty Haggard. Marty is the oldest son of Merle Haggard. Merle Haggard is, in. I agree with Marty, he is the greatest country and western singer-songwriter ever because Merle wrote about his life, songs about people he knew, his journey down the pathway of life. And he was a blue-collar type of person who was able to reach out to the everyday person because the songs that he wrote about and the songs that he sang there was people out there, you know, hey, that's, <laughs> I can relate to that. And Marty is a great friend of ours. We've had him on the show a few times. He's been on the radio show. He's been on a radio show with Donna and me. And, or Donna and me were on my radio show with Marty first time. And then we were on Donna's radio show with Marty, uh, me and her. And then we had Marty on our uh TV show because during the lockdown, there wasn't anything else for us to do except just get online and talk. But if you go to martyhaggard.com, martyhaggard.com, and just click, it just comes up automatically about where he's going to be at. November the 3rd, he will be in Tomball, Texas at the Main Street Crossing. That's a wonderful facility. We were there back in May of this year and we actually filmed his event there. And then the fall, and then Saturday, December 31st, he's going to be at Wichita, Kansas, at the Wichita Union Stockyard. So if you're in those areas and you'd like to see Marty perform, be sure and stop in. And, and, and I mean, you're going to be, you know, if you like good country music and down to earth country music, and Marty's got some tremendous stories because Marty is the oldest son. He was the only one of Merle's children being the oldest son that traveled on the road with his dad when he wrote all that great music back in the 60s. And Marty was just a young kid, and he thought, how does all these people know who my dad is? And he just, you know, just being a young kid, he just looked at his dad as he's my dad, you know. And uh, had very, he's got very fond memories of his dad, loves his dad dearly. Marty's a great, uh, he loves the Lord. He's a great guy, a great friend, and... If you're look, if you like, uh, if you're a country music fan, and you want some good in entertainment, you know, be sure and stop in and see Marty. Uh, go to his website. He has uh, information there. He's got uh, information about himself. His bio shows where he's going to be at, which again is going to be November the third, a Thursday, in Tomball, Texas, at the Main Street 
Crossing. It's a beautiful facility. We know Matt and the people over there. Great facility. And Saturday, December the 31st, this is going to start about 9 p.m. at which in Wichita, Kansas, at the Wichita Union Stockyard. So we want to give a shout out for Marty. And when we say we want to give a shout out, let me put our email address up there. If you know of uh, someone you'd like to give a shout out to, please just send it to us at our email address there, inspiration at E360TV. We'll be glad to do it. If there is a business that has went the extra mile or has been a good, you, you know, been a good uh, vendor or business for you, and you just want to you know, give them a shout out, send it to us. We'll be glad to do it. And we do it first time, uh, you know, right early on in the show, as I should say. And therefore, you can tell your friend or the person who provided the, I like people that go above and beyond the call of duty. I really do. So if you want to give a shout out to a business or to your barber or to your, your hairdresser or whoever, just send the information there. We'll be glad to do it. And it's our compliments. And no, we're not going to chase after them or anything like that to try and sell them something. But I wanted to talk about something that's very, very important. And first of all, I'm going to start over here with cholesterol levels, recommended levels of cholesterol for adults. They're talking about the total cholesterol number. This is the MG slash DL numbers. Optimum is less than 200 total cholesterol. Borderline is 200 to 239, anything that's 240 and up is high, okay? And I'm getting this from the healthycholesterolclub.com. This is on the internet everywhere, so do your research on it. But this is what the medical standard is. LDL, bad cholesterol, is less than 130, is optimal. If you're 130 to 159, you're in the borderline range. 160 and above, it's high. HDL, the good cholesterol, 50 and above is optimal. 40 to 49 is borderline. Less than 40, you're, uh, you're, you're high. So you're, anything of 50 and above and the good cholesterol <laughs> is optimal. Anything less than 130 is of the bad cholesterol is optimal. And anything total cholesterol less than 200 is uh, optimal and your triglycerides anything less than 200 is optional that's the optional thing you want to do you may hear the clock in the background i have a grandfather's clock here and i've got to you know mute it so please excuse that i like clocks i like animals too borderline for triglycerides is 200 to 399 400 and above that's very very high so this is the standard that they recommend all adults should get their cholesterol check no matter what your age is. And this is, uh, you know, like I say, this is for all ages, from 20 on up to 120 or whatever. And so LDL less than 130, okay? Now, here's something that I did not know. This was an eye-opener for me. And before I share that information with you, let me humbly say that imagine how you would feel if you went through life, your, your entire adult life, every time you had a physical, you're doing great, your numbers look good, you know, <clears throat> don't change anything, you know, yada, da, da, da. In 2019, my LDL, the bad cholesterol was 79. We just saw on the chart, or I just shared with you on the chart, that anything under 130 for the LDL or the bad cholesterol is considered to be optimal. That's the, the you know, anything less than 130, you are doing good. Well, I always felt that my blood pressure was good, and I always enjoyed good blood pressure. 120 something over 68, 74, whatever, you know, it varies, varies a little bit, but you know, optimal blood pressure for, for, you know, my man, my age, I'm, I'm 74 now. And my LDL uh, was, was optimal. My 
good cholesterol was good. My triglycerides were, uh, they were a little bit over 200. So I was in the borderline there because anything less than 200 is optimal. Anything a little above 200, I think it was about 225 or something like that. It becomes a little, you know, borderline. But anything 400 above in triglycerides, as we uh, just stated earlier, um, it's very high. So therefore, getting all these tests done and all this, blood pressure good, all my LDLs and, you know, HDL and all that stuff, cholesterol levels were considered to be optimal. I thought that was a safety net for me. Problem was, on Halloween night at midnight on 2021, I found out the hard way that my safety net had a big hole in it, and I fell through it because I suffered a heart attack. It landed me in the hospital, obviously. Now, the real key thing here, and this is critical, at any time you're feeling chest pain, or any type of discomfort, I'm just going to describe my symptoms to you. Everybody's symptoms are different. We're going to go over that in just a few moments. But the night before on that Thursday night, I had a little bit of pressure in my chest. I felt like there was there was a pain, just like a, just best way I can describe it, like an arrow going from one shoulder to the other shoulder, straight across the base of my neck and the backside. And I had pain in both my el- from arms from the elbows down. And so I took a teaspoon of baking soda in a glass of water, stirred it up, drank it, went away. And I thought, well, that's kind of strange. I've never felt anything like that. The very next night, I had the same exact symptoms, except I had one thing more. <laughs> I was extremely restless. It came on me about uh, 1030 or quarter 11 that night. And I, um, if I was sitting in my, I was sitting in my easy chair and I was finishing up doing some work on my laptop. And all of a sudden I just felt restless. I got to get up and move, you know? And if I was sitting down, I felt like I need to stand up. If I stood up, I felt like I need to go lay down. If I laid down, I felt like I need to get back up and, you know, do something else. So I went from the easy chair over to one sofa. Then I went to the sofa out into the day room and I just couldn't get any relief at all. And I went over and of course I had already just taken, uh, the, again, <laughs> a teaspoon of baking soda with water, stirred it up and drank it. It did not even phase it. So then I go to bed and <laughs> I got to refer to my notes here. If I may, I go to bed and I'm trying to get comfortable thinking, well, this, you know, bacon soda is going to kick in. The water's going to, you know, all that stuff is going to kick in. It's going to make me start feeling better and all that. And the thing was, was that I was flipping and flopping back and forth in the bed and it woke up my wife and she said, what's the matter? I said, I don't know. I just, I'm just restless. I just can't go to sleep. And so then she said, well, and she said, well, let me take your blood pressure. And I'm looking here from my notes. This is in the uh, the book that I was invited to be a part of the of uh, your health turnaround story, because I want to make sure I get the numbers correctly. And I should have looked this up earlier, but she took my blood pressure and it was 168 over 84. Now, remember, my blood pressure normally is 120-something over 68 to 78. And I told her, I said, that thing is nuts. It's one of these little portable, you know, battery-operated, you know, battery-powered, I should say. Uh, <clears throat> but it's the same type of uh, <laughs> blood pressure cuff that they use in doctor offices. Same brand. I don't know if it's the same quality or not, but same brand. And she checked it. She says, Jim, it's working fine. My blood pressure is great. And I said, well, let me lay here for a little bit. So I laid there for about five minutes or so, and she checked it again. And now it, it was 168 over 84. It was now 174 over 86. And I said, this is nuts. And it was about, it was after 11 o'clock. So then I said, listen, I'm going to get up and I'm going to go to the ER and I'm going to have this checked out. I don't know what's going on, but I'm going to find out what's going on. Okay. And my wife said, well, you're not driving us. Well, I appreciate that, you know. So we get down there. It's about a 
10 or 15 minute ride from the house. It's only four miles away, you know, as far as the distance we travel, but getting there, getting in the car and getting in there, you know, going. And, but by the time I got into the ER, they took me into the room and they ran the blood pressure on me. My blood pressure had increased to 190 over 111. The reason I share this with you, ladies and gentlemen, is that anytime you have any type of discomfort like that, please, I don't care if you're 20, 30, 40, it does not matter. Please get yourself up. Go to an ER. Let them check it out. And what they'll do, they will draw blood. And if you're having a heart attack, your blood, your, your heart will release a certain protein, uh, troponin, and they will look for that specifically in the blood. If they see that, in, that protein in the blood, they know that they know that they know beyond a shadow of a doubt, you're having a heart attack. So then, you know, they immediately brought me four baby aspirins. They says, take this. And I did. And then they brought a little green and black nitro pill and says, put this under your tongue. Don't swallow it. This thing is little bitty. And I'm going like, okay, did I lose it? You know, and then I found, okay, there it is. Make sure you don't swallow it because they want that nitro to get into your blood and not into your stomach. And it, it, it wasn't long. It may be a minute or two. I don't remember, but it was a very short period of time. But immediately I felt that thing start to open up. And when it opened up to everything, that's when all the pressure in my chest went away. That was the end of my heart attack. My point being, if I would have waited till morning, or if I would have put it off, I could have damaged the muscles in my heart. For you see, ladies and gentlemen, I had a condition known as the widow maker, and we'll go into that in a little bit in just a moment. But I share that with you to now reveal something to you that I found out that shocked me. UCLA, University of California in Los Angeles, back on January the 12th, 2009. Okay, this is now 2022. <laughs> so this has been several, been over a decade, right? A new national study has shown that nearly 75% of patients hospitalized for a heart attack had cholesterol levels that would indicate they were not at a high risk for a cardiovascular event based on the current national cholesterol guidelines. So what's going on here? 75%, nearly 75% of the people <clears throat> who wind up in an ER with a heart attack are just like me. This is one of the reasons why people here at the station and some of my friends have said, Jim, you should be sharing this information with the folks. This is not about you. It's about information. So that's why I want to do this today. And it goes on to say, and I'm sharing this with you. This is from the UCLAHealth.org. It's got forward slash news, forward slash most dash heart dash attack dash patients dash cholesterol dash levels. Dash, and each word has got a dash in between it. Did not indicate cardiac risk. Okay, that's the actual website there. Um, you can freeze the uh, program later on, come back to it, and I'm just going to read the individual words. You know, it's uclahealth.org forward slash news forward slash, and then each word has a dash after it. Most heart attack patients, cholesterol levels did not indicate cardiac arrest. And you can read the documentation for yourself. It talks about specifically these patients had low density, uh, the lip, lipoprotein, uh, LDL cholesterol levels that met current guidelines. And close to half had LDL levels classified in guidelines as optimal, less than 100 milligrams. In 2019, I had a full physical blood and all that. My LDL was at 76. So obviously I should be, you know, have a, a green, green light here. When I was in the hospital, after I had my heart attack and all that, they checked my LDL. I was only 96. I was still under 100. 
So what is going on here? And they go on here to say that almost 75% of heart attack patients fell within recommended limits for LDL cholesterol, uh, demonstrating that the current guidelines may not be low enough to cut heart attack risk in most who could benefit. This is uh, this comment was made by Dr. Greg C. Fonero, Elliot Cord uh, Corday, Professor of Cardiovascular Medicine and Science at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA and the study's principal investigators. Now, <clears throat> while the risk of cardiovascular event increases substantially with LDL levels between 40 and 60, current national uh, cholesterol guidelines for LDL is anything less than 100. And 130 milligrams slash DL is acceptable for most individuals. So that kind of shocked me. And I'm thinking, good grief. What's going on here? Now, my father had heart disease. And I knew my brother had a heart attack uh, back in 2012. And he had the same condition I had, the widow maker. But I did not know. I mean, I knew heart disease was hereditary. I knew that. But if all my numbers are good, I should be good to go, right? That was a mistake that I made, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm going off of the recommended, you know, medical guidelines here. I'm using that. I'm not, you know, uh, going out here on my own. And I'm thinking, my goodness gracious, what's going on here, you know? And so I'm, I'm sharing this with you just for information purposes and for you to do your own research because everybody's case is different. Everybody's, um, you know, just because someone in your family, your mom, your dad, or someone like had heart disease does not automatically mean you're going to have heart disease. It means the indicators are good. <laughs> and we don't know what type of heart disease my father had other than he had heart disease, hardening of the arteries, because he died back in 1978. And we've come a long way in discovering a treatment and that sort of thing uh, since 1978. But my brother had the same condition. Uh, the Widowmaker, he had to have open heart surgery and uh, two or three bypasses. And I was amazed. He, he had two bypasses, excuse me. I was amazed at how well he did. So I'm doing fine. Yeah, I don't have any pain or anything. I thought, wow, you know, I mean, that's that's amazing. And so let me just say right now, when I had my open heart surgery, you got to forgive me that the, the clock's going off again. When I had my open heart surgery, I was that was on Monday, November the 1st of 2021. And I was in the hospital released till they kept me until Saturday. They were thinking about release me on Friday, but they kept me one more day. I guess because they like me. I don't know. But then I'd been in the hospital that whole weekend from Friday night when I had the heart attack, Saturday and Sunday. And I'm going to get into a little bit of that, too. Uh, not for, you know, not not for, you know, what, what, what happened to me there or anything, which nothing, nothing spectacular did, but to illustrate uh, uh, something about the Widowmaker. But when I came home, got released, and even in the hospital, the nurses would walk into the cardiac ward and they'd say, are you in any pain? No, I had no pain. And when I went to cardio rehab, there were several men in there that was in the same boat that I had. They had the open heart surgery. Um, they had, one guy had five bypasses. Me and another guy, we had four one guy had three and one guy had two, but we all had the same basic thing. When we went home, we didn't have any pain. So please, if you have to have open heart surgery or something like that, don't punish yourself. Please do not worry about it. I mean, I realize that, you know, this is the first time you may have had open heart surgery, and it certainly was for me. And I didn't have that much time to worry about it. And I'm going to hopefully get into that. Hopefully I'm doing a good job of, you know, keeping my earpiece in and, and, and leading you down the path. But uh, it really amazed me because I thought I'd have a lot more pain. Now, when you cough, coughing is not comfortable, but it's not painful. 
Let me explain. When someone pokes you in the ribs, you jump, but it's over, right? The same is true when you cough. They will give you these heart-shaped pillows, you know, and put the zipper on them. Everybody belongs to the zipper club. And you hug that pillow or hug any pillow you want to close to your chest when you cough because you got to get that mucus up. And uh, But it's, it's pressure, yes, but it's not painful. You're not going to lay there in bed, oh, man, I'm hurting or anything like that. That's not going to happen because as soon as the cough is over, the pressure's off, it goes right back. Uh, my skin was very sensitive to the touch. It was kind of like it was sunburned. In fact, one night I remember uh, this was the, I got out on, on, sun, on a Saturday morning and then the following week, like about a Tuesday or Wednesday or something like that, I was laying on my back and you cannot lay flat in your regular bed. So forget that. You got to be elevated a little bit. Fortunately, we had a craftmatic bed where you can raise up the head a little bit, kind of like a hospital bed. You're going to need something like that. Or some people get by with their lazy chair. But I was laying on my back. I had my hands folded across my chest like I do. And it woke me up because my hands were too much weight on my chest. So ex expect that, you know. And let me get back into what I wanted to say today about the, the heart condition, especially the Widowmaker. The Widowmaker is a very serious condition. And I'm going to read, uh, share with you, if I may, here, uh, about the Widowmaker. Uh, first of all, when I was in the hospital on that Saturday and Sunday, um, they brought in the uh, ultrasound, which is an echocardiogram. And the ultrasound just gives a lot of good information uh, on the function, the strength of the heart, the valves, the blood flow, all that. And because I had responded quickly and because I had got the, the aspirin and the nitroglycerin into my system, which dissipated the heart attack, which opened up everything so my heart could pump and get the blood and oxygen that it needed. They says, hey, your heart's in great shape. You didn't suffer any muscle damage. Therefore, if I had waited until the morning and let this heart attack continue to this blockage that I had continue to be an issue, I could have created some muscle damage because if your heart cannot get the proper blood flow, you will lose muscle. And when that happens, ladies and gentlemen, that is 100% irreplaceable. You can't go back and fix it. So that is why. You know, if you feel that, please get it up, get it in gear and get to the ER. Even if you're wrong, you'd rather be 100% wrong for the right reason than to be 100% right for the wrong reason. And the electrocardiogram, uh, the ultrasound, they did that on me. And at no time did any of the tests that they did on me. They did a total of 67 tests on me while I was in there. At no time did the Widowmaker reveal or raise its ugly head like a snake out of the grass. Now, when I say 67 tests, that sounds kind of dramatic. Let me explain. Every, I was hooked up to six different things. <laughs> now, not all of them were registering. I had oxygen in, tubes in my nose. I had a mm, saline in one arm. I had... Uh, blood thinner in the other arm. Um, I had EKG on me. I had a blood pressure cuff and I forget what else, but there were six things on me. But every time they would do, they'd read the EKG. That's a test. Every time they took a blood pressure reading, that would be another test. And then every six hours at six in the morning, uh, 12 noon, six in the evening and and 12 midnight, they would come and draw blood from the back of my hands. That would also, each one of those would be a test. So that's how it ticked up to 67. But at no time did any of these tests individually or collectively reveal what my real problem was. So therefore, I'm being told that all I'm going to need is stents. And come Monday morning, I'm now, you know, kind of like in an outpatient mode because I'm just going to go in. I'm going to have the, these uh, 
wire mesh stents put in. I know I'm going to have to take rejection drugs for two years, so my heart won't try to reject the, uh, the, the metal stents. And I'm going to be home by noon. They're telling me, hey, you're going to feel great. <laughs> you're not going to believe how much energy you got, but please pace yourself, okay? You just had a heart attack, you know, you got fresh blood, but, you know, don't overdo it. Don't do something ridiculous. And so I go in there on that Monday morning, <clears throat> and I'm in a good mood. Why wouldn't I be? Because now I'm just going to get the stents done. I'm going to be out of the hospital. I've been there since Friday night, you know, getting poked and all prodded and all these things. And uh, I'm going to be home in the afternoon. I'm going to be feeling great. And I want to say that Dr. William Gray, my cardiologist over in Bryan College Station with the Baylor Scott and White uh, Hospital there, He's a great cardiologist. I have a great rapport with him. Really, really enjoy his personality. And I'm in there, and he's looking at the screen up there, and he's got kind of a serious look on his face. I, I, I just kind of thought, well, okay, he's just figuring out what, you know, what he's going to do. <laughs> and then he told me, he says, Jim, uh, this procedure will not work for you. He says, you have the Widowmaker condition. The Widowmaker is in the LAD. That's the lower portion of the heart. And that's the, the, the front of the heart. That's the main pump. The Widowmaker, if a heart attack is brought on by, caused by the Widowmaker, you have about a 15% chance of survival outside of a hospital. Inside of a hospital, your chances are much greater, but not much. Maybe 50, 60, 70%. That's about it. So the Widowmaker is a very serious thing. Uh, it is hereditary. I found that out. And women can have it too, even though men seem to have, I, I guess that's how why they call it the widow maker, because it's taken a lot of men out. It reminds me also of a friend of mine that I knew back in the 80s. Uh, he had just turned 40 years of age and he was an entrepreneur. He was a hard charger. And he, he you know, just a few days, he, he told me, he says, hey, I just met with my banker and he says, man, I feel like a million bucks. I said, oh, what's going on? He said, well, he says, I'm out completely out of debt. I've got, he says, Jim, just between me and you, he says, I got about $3 million in the bank and I don't owe anybody. I went down and bought myself a brand new truck and I paid cash for it. I said, oh man, that's great. I'm proud of you, brother. I really am. And it wasn't about 10 days later. Now, this guy's in perfect health. He's not even taking aspirins or anything. Doesn't need to. About 10 days later, he's standing on a street corner. He was in Birmingham, Alabama on business. Dropped dead of a heart attack. Now, I don't know, but something like that is, that's usually compliments of the Widowmaker. That's how serious that heart condition is. So when Dr. Uh, Gray told me, he said, these stents won't do you any good. You have to have open heart surgery. You're going to need it today. You got over 90% blockage. He said, I'm going to transfer you to ICU. Doctor, I'll get in touch with Dr. Smith, have him perform the operation, and we'll get you fixed up. So that's exactly what happened. And Dr. Charles Smith came in, very nice guy, got a great rapport with him, really liked both of my doctors, wonderful guys. And he said, uh, yeah, he said, I got a procedure ahead of me. And he says, oh, he pat me on the shoulder, we'll get you fixed up. I said, okay. So I went in and, you know, got fixed up and came back out. And, you know, I just, like I said, uh, I didn't have any pain per se, and I was able to, to get up and move, which I'm grateful for. But, I mean, the next day it was. The first day I was laying there, I'm still in orbit around Jupiter, you know. <laughs> but uh, my point in, in pointing that out again and stating that again is please do not beat yourself up and worry if you're going to have an open heart surgery, if that has to come to pass, because it's not the end of the world. Now let's get back into the Widowmaker. Oh, my goodness gracious. The Widowmaker... It's a rather grisly name, and it typically, typically notoriously targets men, hence the name widow, but it also affects women. It's a life-threatening um, condition for the heart, and it, can, it seemingly attacks healthy people. That's what's so you know, spooky about this thing. 
Up to 4 million Mer- Americans uh, died following a Widowmaker heart attack in the last 30 years. And what's even me more worrying about it, that many of them exhibit no prior symptoms at all. I can relate to that. I can understand that because that's exactly what I went through. Now, for those who do experience this, the symptoms, now, th- these are the symptoms I, ex- I ex- describe what I uh, felt. These are some of the warning signs, shortness of breath, nausea, headache, pain in the jaw, arms or chest, numbness in the fingers. However, at the initial onset, these symptoms are often mistaken for food poisoning or flu. And everybody's symptoms are different. My point of it is, uh, if there's any doubt in your mind, go to the ER. They'll check your blood pressure. They'll draw you blood. If they see that protein in there that's in the blood, because that's what the heart will release, it's trying to break through that plaque. And that plaque has got a certain protein in it. That's what they're looking for. If they see that plaque, that protein in the blood, they know that they know that they know that they know you're having a heart attack. So therefore, you can get the heart attack kind of like, I don't want to say stop, but when they give you the nitro, it's going to open up everything. That's what stopped my heart attack. Please discuss this with your medical doctor. Please discuss this with a cardiologist. I'm not a doctor and I'm not giving advice. I'm just sharing with you my, my journey. And when it comes to the Widowmaker heart attack, it occurs when there is blockage in one or more, sometimes the arteries that supply the thick cardiac muscle of the heart with blood. That is the LAD, the lower arterial, uh, I forget what they call it now, but that's the main pump of the heart in the front. It's the big boy, okay? It's the important one. The blockages are usually called plaque. It's a mixture of cholesterol, white blood cells, and calcium. If there's enough of a buildup in the arteries, it will stem the blood flow. And that's what the heart attack is doing. The heart is saying, hey, I'm not getting enough blood. I'm not getting enough oxygen. So that's why you have that. And and if the blood flow in this vital artery, artery is not restored within an hour or so, the cardiac muscle can die. So don't put it off, ladies and gentlemen. Please don't put that off because once the cardiac muscle dies, it's, it's dead. Your heart may function, sure, but it won't function as the way it should be functioning because part of the muscle is lame, if you want to use that phrase. And these heart attacks can be very secure, uh, very, very severe, excuse me, because many times they can call death cause death here in 98% of the cases. Now, I'm getting this from the walkinlab.com website. I've done a lot of research on heart conditions, and I seem to be getting caught on my cord here for some reason. I don't know why. But the Widowmaker heart attack, any heart attack is serious. There's no question about it. The Widowmaker, it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's the worst one, okay? It's the worst of the bunch, <clears throat> And prevention is better than cure. We all know that in everything. As with most illnesses, the nature of this nature, it's easier to avoid the Widowmaker heart attack than it is to survive it. Now, I have done my own personal study. I recommend you do your study on heart attacks, on the various herbs and things like that. Please, please, please discuss this with your doctor and please If you have a history, if you have a family history of heart disease in your family, tell your doctor, please get me an appointment with a cardiologist. My family has a history of heart disease. I want to know that I know that I know that I know what condition my heart's in. Because a medical doctor is not, well, they're not trained in that area. And when I said earlier about 75% of the patients who hit the ER, that study from the UCLA, um, some doctors dis- disagree with that. And I understand that, but rec- but understand this. When you hit the ER and you got a heart attack, you know, the ER, p- p- the doctor there, he's not going to call your medical doctor. He's going to call a cardiologist. So many times the medical doctor 
doesn't get a chance to see the patient until afterwards. They do not see the patient in the ER. The, the doctors will be talking directly to a cardiologist. That's the way that world turns. And when it comes to your lifestyle changes, I had to give up cheese. Lord, I love cheese. We, <laughs> we all have certain foods we've got to give up. And I had to give up cheese because I, I really enjoy cheese. I loved it on salads. I loved it on everything. But some of the drugs that they had me on, I was reading the side effects of them. And I thought, man, I've got to do something different. There has to be a better way. Um, for example, when I came home, and I'm not going to mention the, any specific drug, but the drugs they had me on, one of them, oh, my goodness, I had to cut it back. And I told my doctor, I sent him an email and say, I'm cutting this thing back. And I told him why. And he said, okay, he understood. I'd go to bed at night. And I'd wake up every hour to an hour and a half, hour, hour and a half around the clock consistently. I didn't get no three or four hours sleep because I had to get up and I had to go to the restroom to relieve my bladder. That thing had me urinating uh, insane. And I thought, man, that's not good for my kidneys. It's kind of like overworking my kidneys. And plus, I'm not getting good, you know, in a, <laughs> uninterrupted sleep. So one night I thought I'd get smart. This shows you how dumb I am. I thought, hmm, I got these powerful pain pills here. I don't take them. I don't need them. But you know what? What if I can take one? And what if I could get three hours of sleep before I get up and start this ever hour, hour and a half, you know, cycle of going to the restroom? I could do that. So I took one of them. It seemed like a good idea at the time, to be honest with you. But what happened was that after about an hour, I woke up and my bladder is full and I've got to go to the restroom. I got no choice. So I sit up in bed because you know, I, I got it. Everything is slow. OK, and you, you're pacing yourself and, you know, your body will tell you what what you can do. So don't worry about that. And so I ease myself up with my arms and. I'm taking a deep breath and relax, and I'm getting my bearings and all that. And I walk down the side of the bed, and I turn to go around the foot of the bed to head out the door. And then, woo, <laughs> I got a little woos. I had to sit down on the bed because I was afraid I'd lose my balance from getting lightheaded because of the medication I had taken. And I thought, no, oh, this, this didn't work out too well. So... I had to hand walk the wall to get there. My point being is that I had to do something because, yes, I wanted to avoid a heart attack. No question about that. I didn't want to go back down that road again. I knew what I've been doing, what I've been eating is now eating me. And I've got to find other ways because prevention is much better than cure. We, you know, we just, we, that's true in everything. And so in my journey, I found an apple, and I already knew this, a lot of the stuff we already know, apple cider vinegar. We know what a wonderful product that is. I found a, um, a product over in Austin, Texas, toughmotherbrand.com. And this lady has 10 different herbs in there. And all the herbs are great for the heart. Plus the apple cider vinegar is great for it. And so I, I take that with water. And when you get up in the morning, first thing you want to do, if you want to lose weight, is drink a glass of water in the morning with lemon or with apple cider vinegar. That is one of the prerequisites to setting your body up to lose weight. It really is. And then I also found out that dandelion, oh my goodness gracious, just do your research on dandelion. I'm not going to make any proclamations or any statements. Just do your research on dandelion and what it can do for your heart. And then, of course, CoQ10. And there's some other things that I've done some research on. And I'm, But my point being, I didn't like the side effects. I wanted to be proactive and not be reactive. And I go in from time to time. I have my blood work done and all that. And I'm coordinating all this with my cardiologist. So don't go out there like a renegade, you know, 
So long, Doc. I'll see you later. <laughs> because if you do not know, listen to me, folks. If you do not know what you're doing, you can harm yourself. And you want to do things, blend things in gradually. I highly recommend that. But I also highly, highly, highly recommend, and I caution you to please get in touch with your cardiologist and your medical doctor. Let them know what you're doing. Don't go off on a blind mission because, you know, just because someone says, hey, apple cider vinegar is good for your heart. You don't need any of this other stuff. No, do not listen to that. That could be dangerous for you because your next heart attack could be fatal. That's how serious this is. So I'm just saying be prudent and look for alternative ways to be able to help your body heal itself. That's my point. That's what I want to say. But again, I'm not a doctor. I don't give medical advice or anything like that because what's good for the goose is not good for the gander. We all know that. So please, please, please get in touch with your doctor, your cardiologist, and let them know exactly what you're doing. And have them do the test, the blood test, you know, listen to your heart and all that. And, you know, I went and saw Dr. Gray and he checked my heart and all that. And he said, man, you're, you're doing good. Blood, you know, blood work, blood pressure and everything looks great. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm comfortable with, with my decision. And uh, I'm just looking for ways for my body to heal itself naturally and to also prevent another heart attack. I was very, very blessed, very, very fortunate because when I got to the ER that night, again, my blood pressure was 190 over 111. And the nurse told me, she says, you don't realize how serious this is. She says, you're in danger of having a massive heart attack or having a stroke. And I've never been a one that panics or anything like that. I just kind of like looked at, okay, well, you know, because it, when they put the IV in my arm, I'm getting, you know, fluid in there and all that. And somehow I just kind of like knew I'm going to be okay. Yeah, I just, you know, so if they, you know, whatever they said to me, okay, fine. I'm going to roll with the punches. I'm like a prize fighter. You get in the ring, you're going to get hit. Okay. <laughs> you get in the corner, you're going to get the tar beat out of you. Okay. You got to roll with the punches, but you're not going to fall apart. That's the main thing. Do not fall apart because your body is an amazing Amazing piece of machinery. It truly, truly is. And I want to go on a little bit more here. Uh, they talk about steps to uh, prevent heart attacks and all that. And it, it's so true because, you know, if you walk, walking and exercise, diet and exercise, we all know that story. So please, 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 um, you know, get your exercise in. Walk daily if you can. And, you know, just, you know, take a, a look at yourself and the way you're living your life and all. And I'm looking here for some specific information. And listen to this. Remember I talked about if you have any type of condition, you don't know what's going on, especially if it's new, like it was with me, pressure in my chest, pain in my arms, my elbows down, the pain in between my shoulders. And then I had that really restless feeling. Almost 70% of heart attacks occur due to the lack of timely treatment. This is coming from the northlines.com. The North, like North Pole, lines, L-I-N-E-S.com. You can read it yourself. This was published uh September 28, 2022, and the uh, panelists at the Nuremberg Diagnostic Panel discussion on hypertension and heart attack, they echoed the sentiment that monitoring our vitals is very, very important to keep our heart in check. And therefore, if you think it's heartburn and like I did, I thought, well, I never suffer from heartburn. I'm going to take some, you know, 
fortunately, I was very blessed. You know, I've, you know, thank the good Lord, He blessed me for my being ignorant. But the point of it is taking um, baking soda and water the first night it wiped it out, but the second night it didn't. And because they told me, says, hey, you had a heart attack. <laughs> the doctor told me that when I was at the college station there on Friday or on Saturday, excuse me. And here's some things that's another. Uh, I'm looking for stuff. I had a bunch of stuff here open. I apologize for it. But um, when it comes to the widow maker si symptoms and signs, and this is true with any heart attack. Uh Chest pain or pressure. I felt pressure is what I felt. Shortness of breath. No, I did not have that. I felt restless. Lightheadedness. No, I didn't have that. Nauseated or vomiting. I didn't have that. I did have the pain, as I mentioned before, and that was all the things. So the, the only thing that I have here in common with these particular things is, of course, the pressure in my chest. And the uh, <clears throat> women can also suffer this from heart attacks, pain in their jaw or neck, sweating, tiredness, shortness of breath, flu-like symptoms. That's why uh, some people think that, um, you know, it could be diagnosed as the flu. So, you know, that's why blood tests are very, very important to look, have them look for that protein to make sure you're not having a heart attack. Now, this is some of the things uh, they talk about your risk for coronary artery disease and a widowmaker increases if you smoke. Okay, I quit smoking in 1972, 73. High blood pressure or high cholesterol. I didn't have any of that. If you have diabetes, I don't have diabetes. You have family members who have had a heart attack. You are obese. Well, you can tell by looking at me. I threw the TV screen. I'm not a fat person. I weigh 160 pounds. And, or you don't exercise. So the thing that I had there was that I had family members with a history of heart disease and that sort of thing. My point being is that heart disease is something that can affect us all. And this all started back in, right after World War I, the world went through the Spanish flu. And then in the roaring 20s here in the States, what's very interesting, if you look at the graphs, you'll see that processed foods started to make a tremendous headway in going forward and being used because it was easy, it was convenient, it was faster, because prior to that, everything was made from scratch. And you can't beat good old-fashioned homemade food made with scratch because you ladies out there, I don't know what it is, your mom, your grandmother, we all have fond memories of uh, mom's cooking and grandma, grandma's cooking because those ladies, they made it with hands of love. You, you just can't beat that. And so as the processed foods on the graph started to go up like this, guess what happened to heart disease? It started going up too. It ran very parallel with the, with the increase and the growth of the in, intake and sales of and the con consumption of the processed foods. So it goes hand in hand because just do your Google research or your internet research on your search engine and just say, when did heart disease become the number one killer in the United States? And when did processed foods start becoming popular? And look at the graphs and compare apples to apples. And you'll see what I'm talking about because we've got to watch what we eat. That is the first line of defense is your nutrition. And then, of course, your supplements are exactly that. They supplement the good things you're already putting in your body. And ladies and gentlemen, our time is gone. And I know I've talked a little bit in the past about my heart disease or heart attack and all that. But... They've encouraged me to go ahead and just share this on a show. And I hope it's been beneficial to you. Please, 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 please do your homework, do your research, discuss everything with your doctor and your cardiologist before 
you go off like a renegade by yourself. Because if you do not know what you're doing and you don't keep a track record, a medical track record of what you're doing, you can harm yourself. God bless you and thank you so much for tuning in. I sincerely hope that you feel worthy enough to love yourself, uh, love yourself enough to forgive yourself, laugh at the dumb things you do. Most importantly, love others enough to forgive them and in some cases let them go. But most importantly, most importantly, learn how to forgive yourself. We're going to be back tomorrow with Joe Teebel. Uh, he was a former trainer with the Kansas City Chiefs, and we're looking forward to having him on about motivation, our youth, because our youth does need some great motivation. I'm Jim Grant, and we'll see you tomorrow. Take care. Bye-bye.